To help their cause, the Christian apologists not infrequently also change the sense of certain Old Testament passages to make them support the miraculous stories in the New Testament. For example, having borrowed from Oriental books the story of the God in a manger, surrounded by staring animals, the Christian fathers introduce a prediction of this event into the following text from the book of Habakkuk in the Bible. Accomplish thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known, etc. Note, Habakkuk 3, 2. End note. This Old Testament text appeared in the Greek translation as follows. Thou shalt manifest thyself in the midst of two animals, which was fulfilled, of course, when Jesus was born in the stable. How weak must be one's case to resort to such tactics in order to command a following? And when it is remembered that these follies were deemed necessary to prove the reality of what has been claimed as the most stupendous event in all history, one can readily see upon how fragile a foundation is built the story of the Christian God-man. Let us continue. Abraham Lincoln's associates and contemporaries are all known to history. The immediate companions of Jesus appear to be, on the other hand, as mythical as he is himself. Who was Matthew? Who was Mark? Who were John, Peter, Judas, and Mary? There is absolutely no evidence that they ever existed. They are not mentioned except in the New Testament books, which, as we shall see, are supposed copies of supposed originals. If Peter ever went to Rome with a new doctrine, how is it that no historian has taken note of him? If Paul visited Athens and preached from Mars Hill, how is it that there is no mention of him or of his strange gospel in the Athenian Chronicles. For all we know, both Peter and Paul may have really existed, but it is only a guess, as we have no means of asserting it. The uncertainty about the apostles of Jesus is quite in keeping with the uncertainty about Jesus himself. The report that Jesus had twelve apostles seems also mythical. The number twelve, like the number seven, or three, or forty, plays an important role in all sun myths and points to the twelve signs of the zodiac. Jacob had twelve sons. There were twelve tribes of Israel, twelve months in a year, twelve gates or pillars of heaven, etc. In many of the religions of the world, the number twelve is sacred. There have been few God saviors who do not have twelve apostles or messengers. In one or two places in the New Testament, Jesus is made to send out the seventy to evangelize the world. Here again we see the presence of a myth. It was believed that there were seventy different nations in the world, to each nation an apostle. Seventy wise men are supposed to have translated the Old Testament, sitting in seventy different cells. That is why their translation is called the Septuagint. But it is all a legend, as there is no evidence of seventy scholars working in seventy individual cells on the Hebrew Bible. One of the church followers declares that he saw these seventy cells with his own eyes. He was the only one who saw them. That the twelve apostles are fanciful may be inferred from the obscurity in which the greater number of them have remained. Peter, Paul, John, James, Judas, occupy the stage almost exclusively. If Paul was an apostle, we have fourteen instead of twelve. Leaving out Judas and counting Matthias, who was elected in his place, we have thirteen apostles. The number forty figures also in many primitive myths. The Jews were in the wilderness for forty years. Jesus fasted for forty days, from the resurrection to the ascension for forty days. Moses was on the mountain with God for forty days. An account in which such scrupulous attention is shown to supposed sacred numbers is apt to be more artificial than real. The biographers of Lincoln or of Socrates do not seem to be interested in numbers. They write history, not stories. Again, many of the contemporaries of Lincoln bear written witness to his existence. The historians of the time, the statesmen, the publicist, the chroniclers, all seem to be acquainted with him, or to have heard of him. It is impossible to explain why the contemporaries of Jesus, the authors and the historians of his time, do not take notice of him. If Abraham Lincoln was important enough to have attracted the attention of his contemporaries, how much more Jesus? Is it reasonable to suppose that these pagan and Jewish writers knew of Jesus, had heard of his incomparable great works and sayings, but omitted to give him a page or a line? Could they have been in a conspiracy against him? How else is his unanimous silence to be accounted for? 
it is more likely that the wonder-working Jesus was unknown to them, and he was unknown to them because no such Jesus existed in their day. Should the student, looking into Abraham Lincoln's history, discover that no one of his biographers knew positively just when he lived or where he was born, he would have reason to conclude that because of this uncertainty on the part of the biographers, he must be more exacting than he otherwise would have been. That is precisely our position. Of course, there are in history great men of whose birthplaces or birthdays we are equally uncertain, though we believe in their existence, not because no one seems to know exactly when and where they were born, but because there is overwhelming evidence corroborating the other reports about them, and which is sufficient to remove the suspicion suggested by the darkness hanging over their nativity. Is there any evidence strong enough to prove the historicity of Jesus, in spite of the fact that not even his supposed companions, writing during the lifetime of Jesus' mother, have any definite information to give? But let us continue. The reports current about a man like Lincoln are verifiable, while many of those about Jesus are of the nature that no amount of evidence can confirm. That Lincoln was President of these United States, that he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and that he was assassinated can be readily authenticated. But how can any amount of evidence satisfy oneself that Jesus was born of a virgin, for instance? Such a report or rumor can never even be examined. It does not lend itself to evidence. It is beyond the sphere of history. It is not a legitimate question for investigation. It belongs to mythology. Indeed, to put forth a report of that nature is to forbid the use of evidence and to command forcible acquiescence, which, to say the least, is a very suspicious circumstance, calculated to hurt rather than to help the Jesus story. The report that Jesus was God is equally impossible of verification. How are we to prove whether or not a certain person was God? Jesus may have been a wonderful man, but is every wonderful man a God? Jesus may have claimed to have been a God, but is everyone who puts forth such a claim a God? How, then, are we to decide which of the numerous candidates for divine honor should be given our votes? And how can we, by voting for Jesus, make him a god? Observe to what confusion the mere attempt to follow such a report leads us. A human Jesus may or may not have existed, but we are as sure as we can be of anything that a virgin-born god named Jesus, such as we must believe in or be eternally lost, is an impossibility, except to credulity. For credulity is no evidence at all, even when it is dignified by the name of faith. Let us pause for a moment to reflect. The final argument for the existence of the miraculous Jesus preached in church and Sunday school these 2,000 years as the sole savior of the world is an appeal to faith, the same to which Muhammad resorts to establish his claims and Brigham Young to prove his revelation. There is no other possible way by which the virgin birth or the godhood of a man can be reestablished. And such a faith is never free. It is always maintained by the sword now and by hellfire hereafter. Once more, if it had been reported of Abraham Lincoln that he predicted his own assassination, that he promised some of his friends they would not die until they saw him coming again upon the clouds of heaven, that he would give them thrones to sit upon, that they could safely drink deadly poisons in his name, or that he would grant them any request which they might make, provided that they asked for it in his sake, we would be justified in concluding that such a Lincoln never existed. Yet the most impossible utterances are put in Jesus' mouth. He is made to say, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. No man who makes such a promise can keep it. He is not saints like the above that can prove a man a God. Has Jesus kept his promise? Does he give his people everything, or whatsoever they ask of him? But, it is answered, Jesus only meant to say that he would give whatever he himself considered good for his friends to have. Indeed. Is that the way to crawl out of the contract? If that is what he meant, why did he say something else? Could he not have said just what he meant in the first place? Would it not have been fair not to have given his friends any occasion for false expectations? Better to promise little and do more than to promise everything and do nothing. But to say that Jesus really entered into any such agreement is to throw doubt into his existence. Such a character is too wild to be real. Only a mythical Jesus could virtually hand over the government of the universe to courters who have petitions to press upon his attention. Moreover, if Jesus could keep his promise, 
There would be today no misery in the world, no orphans, no childless mothers, no shipwrecks, no floods, no famines, no disease, no crippled children, no insanity, no wars, no crime, no wrong. Have not a thousand thousand prayers been offered in Jesus' name against every evil which has plowed the face of our earth? Have these prayers been answered? Then why is there discontent in the world? Can the followers of Jesus move mountains, drink deadly poisons, touch serpents, or work greater miracles than are ascribed to Jesus, as it was promised that they would do? How many self-deluded prophets these extravagant claims have produced? And who can number the bitter disappointments caused by such impossible promises? George Jacob Hollyoak of England tells how in the days of utter poverty, his believing mother asked the Lord again and again, on her knees, with tears streaming from her eyes, and with absolute faith in Jesus' ability to keep his promise, to give her starving children their daily bread. But the more fervently she prayed, the heavier grew the burden of her life. A stone or wooden idol could not have been more indifferent to a mother's tears. My mind aches as I think of those days, writes Mr. Hollyoke. One day he went to see the Reverend Mr. Cribbis, who had invited inquirers to his house. Do you really believe, asked young Hollyoke to hit the clergyman, that what we ask in faith we shall receive? It never struck me, continued Mr. Hollyoke, that the preacher's threadbare dress, his half-famished look, and necessity of taking up a collection the previous night to pay expenses, showed that faith was not a source of income to him. It never struck me that if help could be obtained by prayer, no church would be needy, no believer would be poor. What answer did the preacher give to Hollyoke's earnest question? The same which the preachers of today give. He parried his answer with many words, and at length said that the promise was to be taken with the provision that what we asked for would be given, if God thought it for our good. Why, then, did not Jesus explain that important provazo when he made the promise? Was Jesus only making a half-statement, the other half of which he would reveal later to protect himself against disappointed petitioners? But he said, If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. And, If it were not so, I would have told you. Did he not mean just what he said? The truth is that no historical person in his senses ever made such extraordinary, such impossible promises. And the report that Jesus made them only goes to confirm that their author is only a legendary being. When this truth dawned upon Mr. Hollyoke, he ceased to petition heaven, which was like dropping a bucket into an empty well and began to look elsewhere for help. Note, bygones worth remembering, George Jacob Hollyoak. End note. The world owes its advancement to the fact that men no longer look to heaven for help, but help themselves. Self-effort, and not prayer, is a remedy against ignorance, slavery, poverty, and moral degradation. Fortunately, by holding up before us an impossible Jesus, with his impossible promises, the churches have succeeded only in postponing, but not in preventing, the progress of man. This is a compliment to human nature, and it is well earned. It is also a promise that in time, humanity will be completely emancipated from every phantom which in the past has scared it into silence or submission, and a loftier race than e'er the world hath known shall rise, with flame of liberty in their souls and light of science in their eyes. End of The Problem Stated.